You make two points in terms of, uh, you say that at this point it is fair to say that public policy and its impact on asset allocation will remain the key driver in 2013. You said there would be two critical policy-induced drivers this year. One, you mentioned the fact that with safer, fewer safe haven bonds giving central banks buying and downgrades of several sovereigns combined with a high demand amidst macroeconomic uncertainty, traditional safe havens look very expensive. That's one point that mm -hmm. you're making. The second point you make is that the fear of a catastrophe should continue to ease. Mm -hmm. In this backdrop, and considering that India would be competing with other countries to get money, and my last year, perhaps, we got a lot of it, as you mentioned, because we seemed better than the worst. How would that be a positive for India, given these two factors? Positive in, in terms of... The Getting more money. Yeah, I think, it, it's, well, I think, it's, I think that those are very, very important factors, that, that both of those, because naturally, risk appetite. I think for, for five years now, we've been li living in an environment where risk has been a major driver in fear of catastrophe, mm. particularly the Eurozone. And that, that is, not, policy, policy uncertainty has not disappeared. We still have to get through fiscal negotiations in the US this year. And, and the U European governments will still make, they'll make mistakes and cause volatility through that period. But, but, the un, but the, that fear of what is, is it going to implode and cause catastrophe in the global economy, that's disappeared. And I think Indian equities clearly is a risk asset. And also, it's a risk asset which, one of the reasons it wasn't getting a share of, of fund flows was because it was becoming uninvestable. So government policy was so bad um, at one point that people were just, a lot of investors we spoke to just didn't want to touch. It wasn't worth it because of the amount of uncertainty. I think that's diminished. And so India looks like a place to go for yield. In a world of low yield, yeah. India is clearly an environment, both in fixed income and in equity terms, where, okay, growth is at a, at a cyclical low, but we, we could still see GDP recovering to about 6.5% in FY14, which would make it one of the more attractive, one of the most attractive in terms of, in, in terms of growth amongst the major, the major economies. And so in the search for yield, India should be high on the list as long as it can maintain and implement. So it's maintaining policy momentum, but also Chidambaran's done a great job in terms of announcements, but we've got to see the implementation and those things yielding results, as well as, I think, averting um, more populist policies as we get towards the back end of this year and we get closer to elections. Mm. You make a very interesting point. You say we got 26.6 billion, according to SEBI, whose numbers we find misleading, but nevertheless are at least indicative. What is your sense? It could be more or it could be less? It, it, I think it's less. I think it's less. We find it difficult. Yeah. So I, I, I've spoken to EPFR, which is the, the, the primary fund flow analysis firm in the world. I've spoken to them many times about this to try and match up SEBI's data to the data they show. And they show a very different picture. Some of the gap can be explained by some of its, its changing between FDI. Um, so for example, there's a stake in HGFC which changed from FDI into, into FII. Some of its sovereign flows which are not picked up. Some of its high net worth flows. But I still struggle to get to, to the figure. And I think so the main thing is have actually got much more. No, I think it could have been, I think the figure was, could have been, the real flows figure is lower. I think it's a, it's a slightly misleading figure in that people interpret it as being $26 billion of foreign institutional asset management money flowing in, which I don't think it is. I think it's, that's, there's more of a mix in there. And I think there's possibly some round tripping of money going on there as well. So I think it's misleading, but it's still an indicator. I mean, you're saying it's, it's a strong indicator of flows, but it's... The reason I'm asking you that or wanting to delve on that is because there are some experts, Nick, who say that the dependence on this money is so great that even if something goes wrong and a billion or two goes out, hmm. we could see a sharp fall. Are, yeah. you, are you of that view as well? Well, I think both in terms of... India as a country is running a, a, sh a high current account deficit and yes, it's been deteriorating yes. and, and I think that is a real risk uh, and, and dependency upon short term capital flows which FII flows are is, is a major risk to be running at a current account level but also from a market perspective it's a thin market it outflows from domestic funds last year were what four and a half billion dollars and you still see relatively limited retail participation a sustainable economy and a sustainable rally in the markets ultimately requires adequate domestic participation and, and belief in markets, both from a kind of efficiency, so too much savings is going into gold and real estate, that it's more effectively used if it's flowing into markets, and also that correlation, if you look at correlations between FII flows and, and the Sensex, they're very high, mm -hmm. so hence any kind of major international policy um, risks and changes has a, has a very sharp impact on the Indian markets. 